tuned for The Joan Quinn Profiles. As an editor for Andy Warhol's interview, the Los Angeles Herald Examiner, LA Style, and Detour Magazines, Joan covered the social set, the Hollywood hotshots, the international art scene, the mysteries of food, the excitement of travel, and the fabulous world of fashion. Joan continues to find creative people on the cutting edge who make things happen. Here's Joan Agajanian Quinn. Hello, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome to the Joan Quinn Profiles. In the studio is artist Michael Knapper and author Elizabeth Cozen. Painter Michael Knapper was born and raised in Pasadena. In his quest for art, he lived in San Francisco and Santa Barbara before settling in Los Angeles. In the 70s, Michael was a performance artist before he got into the visual arts. Michael, what did you do as a performance artist and how did it influence your move? Well, I started out, I came across in an art magazine, a performance that Joseph Boyce did, mm -hmm. where he lived in, um, <coughs> um, uh, inside a cage that was inside a gallery uh, with a, a, a wolf, a coyote, for uh, the length of one week. And uh, I don't, I, you know, I didn't understand what it was about or anything, but it just had this real poignant, mystical quality about it. And so I uh, became interested in, in uh, doing performance and having had no formal training, but other than just reading about uh, different actions that Alan Capro had done and even going back to uh, the Cabaret Voltaire in Berlin in the 30s. I sort of just did my own research and uh, started to try to do my own work out on the streets. Uh, it was more sort of guerrilla theater actions, uh, sometimes uh, not letting anybody know that they were going to occur, but just doing them. Did in San Francisco? Were uh, you? It was mostly Santa Barbara. Well, mm -hmm. Because didn't they uh, start doing that in San Francisco with the uh, uh, pantomime groups and different? Yeah, uh, I, I think it was them. an out. I mean, the early, early stuff happened in New York. Uh, Jim Dine, the painter, actually did some performances in the '60s, and. Um, Alan Capra, who was also a visual right, artist. Right, But you couldn't actually go to school to learn performance art anyway, could you? No. In fact, <laughs> I got into an argument one time with uh, Eleanor Anton, mm. who was a performance artist. And uh, I was down in San Diego, and I had met her, and I knew that she was going to be teaching a class in performance art. And it wasn't a history of performance art, but it was actually a studio class. And I just, uh, that didn't make any sense to me. I was going to say, then it turns out to be um, planned. And I think performance art is not a planned thing. If you're doing it in the streets, maybe if you're doing performance art on stage, yeah. which turns out to be acting then, doesn't it? Yeah, I mean, I think that's where it, it crosses over into theater then. Uh, performance art is, is by, I think, its very essence. It's got to be something that is uh, teetering on the edge of uh, something that is, you know, uh, dangerous or, or not necessarily in not a physical expected, sense. Not expected. Not yeah. expected, really. Yeah, that's, that was the beauty of it for me. When you were uh, doing that work, I know you kept a lot of diaries. I have a couple of your diaries on the table, on the set right now. Um, did those actually depict some of the performance art? Um, it started out as uh, just documenting and, and oh, right. as, as notebooks for them. These are uh, later, uh, after I'd stopped doing performance, and um, they just are composed of uh, everything, uh, photography, drawing, writing, clipping. Give us a little run through with that. You can see it on um, there. This is just, uh, this is from 1994, I believe. It was after I'd come back from India for three months. So my head was just really spinning with a lot of different images and uh, photographs that I'd had. Um, a lot of the uh, material in the, uh, the books uh, is found material uh, on the streets, in magazines. So they're really uh, collages. And then are, is it poetic or is it just essay mm, form? Well, you know, it's, it varies. They've gotten a lot more visual over the years and a lot more uh, where I just use them for ideas for uh, paintings that I'm working on ah, currently. I see. Um, at this time, I wasn't doing as much painting, so the artistic energy that I had went directly into the books. Well, have you considered the archival uh, 
being of these books? Yeah, I mean, you know, eventually <laughs> they're going to go back to dust like everything else, but uh, they hold up pretty well. I've been keeping them for uh, over 20 years. Oh, you have? And the earliest ones are still, they're hanging on, as long as I don't, you know, <laughs> travel around too much with them. And uh, have you ever thought of showing them? How, w how do you think you would yeah, show them? Yeah, I had them in a show, uh, two or three shows back, I had uh, this, we found this old uh, Victorian medicine cabinet and we prop them up in there to different open pages and, and they looked really beautiful in there as these kind of artifacts specimens of sorts. So it's, but they couldn't be moved you just had them yeah pretty much I mean and people wanted to look through them and uh, did you, you know, let people mo look through them uh, you know I have and and uh, I did early on at the opening but then it got too crowded and and it was just you know got too uh, too dangerous for the books you have another book also that you brought. Is this more or less the same idea or at a different time of yeah, your life? Yeah, this is an ongoing one. <clears throat> Some of the diaries are just specifically this year, 90, 94, 95, 96. This is a larger book and it's, uh, it's ongoing. Um, and uh, I'm just using it uh, currently to, um, to put different uh, ideas for drawings and paintings in and work out different ideas. So we have two of your paintings on the set. With this, uh, actually, this page that you just turned to, mm -hmm. it gives me a feeling of something of, of the work behind us. Is yeah. it more or less? Uh, yeah, this, this of all the pages right now in this one is more of a complete study for a future painting, even though it looks very messy to my mind. But uh, it's, it's, you know, it's got a lot of layers in there. It's got fragments of letters and words. So when we go from the study, from the diary, then we come to something like this, like one of the paintings mm -hmm. behind us. Uh, t tell us about this. Yeah, these. well, it completely changes. I mean, I, I don't do studies that I will then basically transfer, but it's just working out ideas and concepts and um, a series of layers and what works. So, so tell us about the one behind you, the R. Uh, this Does is, it stand for something? Well, this is called the Dark Era of Flight. And uh, it's about birds, basically, but it's, a, it's about the real fra fragile nature of birds and flight, <coughs> um, but also metaphorically flight in the sense of leaving something, um, loss. I think that uh, there's a real fragile quality to the line in it that speaks of, you know, something disappearing. Has this been exhibited somewhere? Yes, these uh, um, are actually both uh, in a show right now at Michael Filona's Architectural Studio. Let's talk about this one too, as long as we're talking about these two okay. great paintings you've brought. And what kind of media? It's uh, acrylic and oil and charcoal. Um, and the both these canvases, the way I've been working the last year or so is to uh, to actually use drop cloths that I have previously used as drop cloths but cut them out and stretch them on canvas and then start painting on them for the next paintings. Oh, that's So fabulous. it's a continual thread of, of kind of that's, a history. That's great. So the, are they canvas or are they more of a they're, heavy fabric? They're canvas, yeah. So you I use buy canvas? canvas and then I just drop it on the studio floor and I wait till it has a certain amount of history built up into it and then stretch it around it and then like start working with it. It seems like the work seems more uh, of collage of found objects of the past transported into something very contemporary. Yeah, I think it's got um, kind of an alchemical quality to it where it's, you know, transforming certain, uh, certain materials, certain found things, and um, putting them in, uh, arranging them in such a way that people will look at them anew you know, for the fr first time, maybe. You did a, um, s a show called uh, Ex Sequentia. Ex Sequentia. What mm -hmm. does that mean, and, and um, what was the show about? It's Latin for uh, of the sequence, and, uh, you know, having been raised uh, Catholic, I, you know, have a, a love-hate relationship with the Latin language. <laughs> But, um, do we use? Do we have any Latin here? No, not any of the one of these. No. But, uh, <laughs> Just existentia. They'll, they'll it'll be showing Ex up. Exequentia. Exequentia, and uh, it's it's just uh, it means of a series. Uh -huh. And so uh, because I had uh, some diaries in that show, which are very serial and ongoing, 
and I was doing paintings at that time that hung one on top of each other, ah. uh, like a calendar. But uh, layered again. Yeah, You're very again into layers. This stuff. Yeah, I like layers and and sort of you know digging down into the layers and letting certain certain parts of one layer be exposed and overlap into the the. How do you hang layer. something like that? Um, it's hanged on a it's hung on a uh, a rod. And uh, it's a like a calendar. Rod? Oh yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's like a you know a rod, and then it hangs, and they kind of overlap. You can see the edges coming through, and then uh, there's one that is uh, called Four Seasons, uh, which is very large, um, and each one is is four drawings hanging on one top of each other, but each one is a season: winter, mm. spring, Fabulous. summer, fall. What? Well, You've used a lot of materials now, but just before we leave, in the future, are there any kinds of materials you want to experiment with? No, not, uh, you know, I use a lot of different things. Uh, you know, I'll throw dirt or cement into the, onto the canvas and then scrape it down to get a certain quality uh, But texture. is this all done just kind of extemporaneously rather than thought out? Yeah, I mean, when you're sort of work, when I'm working, there's a there's a certain flow of of things going, um, and I like to let chance, the, uh, the element so. of chance, into it. So it, it's you know sometimes it's just a matter of like oh this is nearby when I need it and boom. But will they always will in. they be on canvas? What Pretty about much. wood? Have you ever worked on wood? I have done some stuff on wood, but I like canvas and I like paper a lot. And, and trying to push that really traditional medium into something else. Well, before we go, one last question. Have you made any of your own paper? Have you thought about that? I have in the past, and, and I'm planning to do so in the future. And uh, the show I'm going to be into it, that's, that's coming up at Gallery Sulip in West Hollywood uh, in March. Um, there may be some work there that's done on handmade paper. They do a lot of, Sulip does a lot of handmade paper Yeah, things. that's why I really so like that gallery because they have a lot of uh, a real respect and love for the material of paper. That's an interesting pl time now to use that paper to show at their gallery. Well, we'll see you. We'll see you in your show. We right. thank you for coming thank and you, being John. with us. And don't go away. When we leave Michael Knapper, we will be back with Elizabeth Cozen. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and we're back with Elizabeth Cozen, the author of Zen and the City of Angels, and Zen and the Art of Murder. Elizabeth was born and raised in New York, and way back in 1973, she broke the sex line for Little League Baseball. Elizabeth spent more time, more than a decade, as an award-winning journalist. I don't know if she spent more time being a journalist or being an author, but we'll find out. And as a journalist, she was a sports writer. She uh, also contributed to Sports Illustrated, I read all your bio and I decided you must have been a frustrated athlete. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, most sports writers yeah. are. Most sports writers are. I know. think they are, especially men. But I didn't yeah. know you were a Little League baseball player, so. But I, I, I never wanted to be a sports writer. It just sort of fell into it. How so. did that happen? Um, I was an investigative reporter and um, I was out of work for a few months. I was sick. And the, the, I was I had taken a new job with the Washington Times in, in D.C., covering, uh, you know, uh, I think this business of retail. You know, I, I <laughs> investigating was, that. Right, was just it was more like just ba the Toy Fair, Bloomingdale's, oh, you know, oh, that kind uh, of thing. Uh, uh, uh. And uh, when I was in the hospital, the sports editor was a really nice guy, and he called me all the time, and we got to talking. And when I got back to work. It, he he called me up and said, we want you to take a job covering Maryland, the University of Maryland, football, men's uh, football and basketball, simply because they needed someone who had had, you know, some hard news experience. So that's how it started. Was it easier uh, to be a sports writer than an investigative much writer? Much harder, much harder. Why was it? Um, sports writers not only have to know about what you're writing about, but you also have to be a good writer. And at the time, I wasn't. And I thought I was. But I wasn't. I really learned over time how to be a better, um, 
you know, how to be a better writer. The first six months was absolute hell. So it was much harder being a sports writer. Much, much harder. At least investigative work, you've got the facts, right? Yeah, and, and you could take more time to do it, and um, there wasn't a lot of pressure to get the story the next day. A lot of what I worked on, oh, I worked right. for a weekly in, in uh, Northern Virginia, and a lot of what we worked <laughs> on, we took weeks and weeks, sometimes months. Investigating. Yeah. I see, but then sports, you have to know what's happening the next day. Exactly. Though you can say something today that's totally true, and tomorrow it could be totally, <laughs> you could change your mind, and you'd still, in sports, you could get away with a lot more. But. I was uh, the society editor at the Herald Examiner, and of course I had to report the next day because right. it gets to be, it's dead news. Nobody right. wants to hear about it much later. But um, it seemed like it was much easier to me to do that. It, it seems like sports and fashion, you have to come up with a new idea every time because who wants to read about the same old things in fashion or the same things happening in sports? They threw the ball, they got him out, he slid into yeah. first. What do you do? Well, the great thing about sports <laughs> is that there's, there's, within the sports, there's always a great stories to tell. And, and I always look for those, you know. Um, you look for the moment when the game changes, the, or you look for something in a player over a series of games, and those are my the, the stories I love to write. I, I would call them theme pieces, and I love to write about, um, you know, about about the, the development of of kind of stories. They were to me, they were just that, and they were just stories, um, more like fiction. Ah. Only I was telling them as fact, you know, because that's what they were. Now it starts leading me into your book in yeah. a way. I didn't think this is, was going to happen, but <laughs> how and when did you decide to write a book? Um, I had always wanted to write. Um, I thought I wanted to write for film or direct or something, and um, I wrote it as a joke. I, I hung out at a bar in Santa Monica <laughs> called Father's Office, and. <laughs> Uh, someone had written us, you know, a short story that was kind of like a detective novelish kind of thing, and and we talked about. It. I said I can do that, no problem. And I wrote, you know, I started writing a draft, and the first draft was really horribly awful. <laughs> but it got me to thinking. There was some things in it that were that were good, and and it was fun. And at the time, I I wasn't that happy at work, and I would go home and be with these you know, create these characters I wanted to be with. And that's how it started. It really started as a joke. And then I had met a lot of writers in, as a journalist, and they encouraged me to go forward with it. And who to thunk it? And that was it. Zen, of course, Zen turned out to be Elizabeth, <laughs> I guess. Well, it's, is that how you got all these ideas? Well, a lot. Uh, the character Zen is, is a female detective based in Santa Monica. And yes, roughly based on myself because I'm, I know myself better than anyone, but and also she's, detective work, investigative journalism. Yeah, I journalism. did a little bit of that. <laughs> I, I remember when I was a, when I was investigative reporter, I would I would uh, work with a couple of you know private detectives just yeah. to see what they would do and stuff. But I, I find that I use very very little of that in in the in the in the books. Oh, you do. Yeah, I find it's just more about it's they're really detective novels. That's the 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 structure, if you will, of what I've written. But to me, they're, they're just stories, you know, of really interesting characters, I hope. And I'm more after sort of how they develop more than whether what the mystery is and, you oh, know. Oh, you're really more interested in the character. Yeah. Well, but then I guess you're more interested in Zen, who yeah. it really depicts a lot of what you've done. Well, she's an interesting character. <laughs> so I mean, there. she is, and I like to spend time with her for sure. And and she's not based on me, based on other people. Um, I tell a funny story. She isn't me. She's like my sort of braver, thinner, uh -huh. you know, kind of you know, stupider version of me. And because um, she does a lot of dumb things, but. I remember my mother read it and she called me up and she said, sweetheart, it's just wonderful, but but did you have to put me in a cult? Because the <laughs> character's mother is in a cult. <laughs> and and I said, Mom, it's not me, you know, but, but yeah, that's I've so gotten she that thought response. It too. She felt the same way. My friends always say I can't read it without thinking of you. But hopefully over time. But a lot um, of the same situations happen to Zen that have happened to you, like the loss of a lung. Yeah, she's we have similar characteristics. I mean, I lost a lung in nineteen ninety to uh, lung cancer. Were you a heavy smoker? No, I, I didn't smoke 
knock it off. I was thinking that as a sports writer, this yeah. is my own imagination putting something into right. your character. As a sports writer and being in the room all the time and being in the, in the um, uh, com composing room like, like we used to work. That people would be smoking around. I actually you all the became time. a sports writer after I got sick. In fact, oh. getting sick was a sort of life changing moment. I mean, really? I think of myself now as a two lung person, as a one lung person, because <laughs> my life's totally changed since then. And I, I initially was, was given five years to live, and I, you know, they weren't sure if they could operate, and it was about a month there where we didn't know what was going on, and it was really scary, but it gave me this opportunity to sort of say, well, what would I do? If I had five years left, what would I do? And I thought, well, I'm going to move out to California. Oh. I don't know why I was thinking uh, that. Oh, from but Washington. I did. Right. I mean, from the East. Right. I was on the East Coast, and I'd never been out there, and I finally got a chance, not till two years later, I'd gotten a chance to cover the Rose Bowl. Uh -huh. And when I came out here, I knew this was where I wanted to be. And within about six months, I was out here. And the California sunshine healed you completely. Yeah. Well, I was pretty healed before then, but... <laughs> we want to take credit. Right, yeah. I, you, for, as far as I'm concerned, my, I'm coming up on the 10th anniversary, which oh, is great. Bravo, so, bravo, yeah. bravo. So, but it's, tell me. Having, uh, the most interesting thing is that it's really difficult for me, even as a writer, um, that I think I'm a very uh, you know, I can intuitive writer and I can be interested perspective, but it was really difficult to write about that part of me, you know, and that experience because it always sounded a little off, not true. And yet it was so true, right? It was the truest thing I've ever been through. So um, it, it's so hard to, to put that on paper and only really, I started, I did a little bit in the first book, um, a writer, a friend of mine, um, the great Bob Craze, he writes Elvis Cole novels here in LA and he's been a big supporter of mine. It really, um, I feel like I'm his, you know, little <laughs> prodigy. But um, Bob said, you know, you should write more about that experience because it is very real and very authentic. So I'm, I put more into the second Zen book, and even more is into the, the third book. That's what I was going to ask. You talk about getting it down. How did you get it down on paper? Physically, how did you do it? Did um, you keep notes, or did you You mean write? the book itself? Yeah, or? the book, physically. You know, I am embarrassed to say this because it's not a good thing to, to say to people who are trying to write, but I literally just sat down and wrote it. And you mean on a piece of paper with your I wrote it on I wrote first on an old Tandy computer, and I lost about... 50% of the first book. Uh. It was probably lousy anyway, and, and the first draft. And then I wrote it, and I finally, and then my boyfriend let me use his computer. I had actually gotten to the point where I was rewriting the first 220 pages or something. But you did sit at a computer. You didn't Eventually, long hand yeah, it. Yeah, I can't write because I'm a sports writer and, and a, a journalist. That's all I use. So you had to use the, you use a computer. So when he said, get it down on paper, you, you went to the computer and got it down. Yeah. I. I I, I was struggling, you know, I was, just, I, I was, I'm writing this novel, all my friends, I'm writing this novel. <laughs> and one of my friends, my friend called me up and she's a screenwriter and she said, you know what, you want to be known as someone who's writing a novel or someone who's written a novel. And it had a huge effect on me. Really? She re yeah, and I took the next, I took vacation from work nine days and I finished it. I wrote a hundred some odd pages in nine days and I finished it. It's really true though, because when you talk to people and they say, what are you doing? Oh, I'm writing a, a book. And you talk to them right. five years later, I'm writing a book. What are you writing about? I can't tell you. I didn't want to be there. I didn't <laughs> want to go there. I didn't want to be, I, I, I can't tell you how many times I've been, um, in my life where I've started things I didn't finish and I just didn't want to so she you know and, and it was really it was to me the day I finished it now the book changed radically since then I've rewritten it I rewrote the first book uh, another two times I didn't sell it till a, a year and a year and a month later than that but but I <coughs> having when I finished it I remember it was about one o'clock in the morning in some in June or July or something and and uh, all by myself, and in my bo the, my boyfriend's cold back room, and I thought, this is you know, I'm, I've accomplished something. That no matter what happens the rest of my life, I've accomplished something. What took longer, the first book or the second book, to write? Well, the first book I wrote over a four-year period, and yeah. year. The second book, because I a lot happened to me because of the first book, 
and I didn't have enough time to write the second book, so I wrote it much faster. I wrote the second book in about six months. What um, happens now? The next thing Zen does. What's Zen doing next? In the second book or the third book? Third book. In the third book, um, she's she, Zen Moses, right? Right, Zen Moses. Yeah. In the third book, she goes. Um, in the third book, a friend of hers from college, her college roommate, comes to see her and tells her that. Um, that there's two completely unrelated murder uh, deaths are actually murders and are related, and this woman is of from a kind of a Kennedy like a family, um, uh, you know, old old money, uh, big politics. Um, although they made their money in oil, and um, she's killed in front of Zen, but Zen is spared, and Zen goes to the funeral, which is in D.C., and uh -huh. and starts to uncover, and it's like a Kennedy situation where. Uh, the generations, people are dying, but they're really being murdered, and there's a really interesting reason why they're being murdered. Oh, very good. <laughs> and it takes her to D.C. and and Florida. It's a, she's. It's a much bigger book. It's a little darker than the first two. So did you find yourself really developing as a writer? Are you getting more and more into it? I hope so. I I find. Do you feel it? Phys yeah. I I hope so. Sometimes I do. Um, Sometimes I feel I'm doing better than, and sometimes I feel I should work harder on it. Um, these books, because of the way the publishing industry works in terms of mysteries, you gotta churn them out. It's like the Acme book writing Sure, company. because they wanna see where right. she goes next. Just like I'm asking you, where did she go from right. there? And we have to leave, time is yeah. up. But how did you find her name, Zen Moses? Um, it was, it's really a dumb answer. I wanted to call her Buddha originally. I wanted to call her something really strange. And I thought, well, let me put two philosophers together, Zen and Moses, and then they'd call. But it got too confusing, so I kept it. And I meant to change it up until the very moment it was published. But I didn't, but I couldn't think of anything better. So it's Zen Moses, not Zen Buddha. Right. Thanks for being with us, Thank Elizabeth, you. very much. And thanks for watching us on the Joan Quinn Profiles today. Keep riding 777 South Figueroa, 44th floor, Los Angeles 917. We'll see you next time on the Joan Quinn Profiles.